Thank you. Um, you have to forgive my voice. I have a little bit of a cold, but hopefully it won't uh, uh, impact things too much. Um, so today I'm going to talk about string theory without supersymmetry, which is a kind of fun and interesting topic and something I'm, I'm thinking about hard right now. Um, let me start by thanking my collaborators. Primarily what I'm going to talk about is work with Zinni Vicara, who was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago and is now a first year graduate student at Harvard. And uh, my former student, Daniel Robbins, who's a professor at Albany. And those are these two gentlemen. By the way, does the pointer show up if I move it around here? Okay. Yes. Um, so let me give you an outline. The talk is meant to be very informal. Uh, maybe I should have done this on an iPad, which is uh, uh, more of a Blackboard style. But I'll, I'll start off with an introduction about the kinds of questions that I want to address and, and the sort of approach I want to use to address them. Then I'll very briefly overview, overview some no-go results that constrain things like the string landscape. And many of these things will be very familiar to people in this audience who've thought about swampy type issues for, for a very long time. And then I want to explore what I want to call quantum string solutions. And I'll explain what I mean by quantum as opposed to classical string solutions. And I'll explain the basic idea. I'll update the current status. And I was going to include some discussion of instabilities that are non-perturbative, but I think we'll probably, that'll probably be enough for today. And we'll go from there. Okay, and feel free to interrupt at any time. I, I prefer this as a conversation than a, than a seminar. Okay, so let me start with, uh, with an introduction. So the first question you might ask, well, why look beyond classical th string theory? I pick up Bolchinsky, I learn how to work out well sheet string theory, and I can do perturbation theory and go from there. Why, why, why do we need more? Uh, well, classical string theory, a la textbook uh, string theory like Bolchinsky, usually involves specifying a well sheet conformal field theory as a first step. And such conformal field theories, as we know, do not have to describe geometries in spacetime or solutions of supergravity. They could be more abstract ideas like Lando Ginzburg theories or other phases that just have the right properties to give us a string background. But by far the most heavily studied class of examples are solutions of supergravity, like Calabi-Yau cross flat space or ADS cross a sphere with some fluxes. And what we've learned over the last 40 years is that it's easy to find supersymmetric solutions that are Minkowski and ADS in that context. <clears throat> On the other hand, you look around the universe and you look at and you see that the universe is, is accelerating. It has a large component of dark energy, about 70% of the critical energy density. And the scale of that dark energy is very, very small compared to the Planck scale. So you say, what's going on? It doesn't look like anything we see coming out of naturally out of string theory. And there are two sort of proposals for, for leading proposals, I should say, for explaining what this dark energy might be. The first one was a landscape of metastable the sort of vacua, the string landscape, namely that the, the string uh, effective potential, say for compactifications to four dimensions, is incredibly complicated, has a huge number of uh, minima, and one of them accidentally will, will have a cosmological constant positive and small enough to describe our universe. <laughs> this is usually the picture I draw from a long time ago for just this potential, but we're in the age of AI, so I had to ask Dali, what Dali thought a string landscape should look like. So last night I, I hopped onto OpenAI and said, Dali, what's a conceptual picture of the string landscape in theoretical physics? If you don't specify theoretical physics, you just get actual strings and knots. But if you put in theoretical physics, it will generate this kind of abstract, interesting uh, picture. I found it uh, kind of soothing in some way. It actually does remind me of, uh, of what perhaps one might think of as the, as the string landscape. The other comment about the string landscape is we often think of it as a massive degeneracy coming from flux vacuum. But what we've learned over the past, I don't know, 15 plus years, is that there's a massive degeneracy coming from geometry, that the number of calabi yau spaces is enormous, the number of three folds and the number of four folds. And that alone, regardless of anything to do with fluxes, gives you a sufficient degeneracy that one could have a picture like this one and explain the observed cosmological constant. So that's one proposal. The other proposal is that uh, the Sitter space doesn't exist in quantum gravity, that it resides in the swamp land. And this comes under the, uh, the name, the refined De Sitter conjecture by people sitting in the audience who, who know this much better than me. 
And it's a conjecture that constrains the effective potential, either the slope of the effective potential, so you don't get a minimum, or the curvature, so you don't get a stable minimum that's Decider-like uh, out of string theory. <clears throat> if this is true, then Decider is indeed in the swamp plant, and we shouldn't be able to find it. And today, I think it's fair to say we don't know what the, what the, what the right uh, answer to this story is. So again, I had to ask Dali, could you generate an image that, that would represent uh, a conceptual picture of the swamp plan from theoretical physics? And this is what it came up with, which is really kind of weird and interesting. Um, but uh, uh, this is what Dali likes to think, AI likes to think of as, a, as the swamp plan. And perhaps the city resides here. Okay, so <clears throat> there are no-go results, which I'll sketch very briefly, that make an explanation of dark energy in classical string theory very difficult. Um, almost impossible, I'd say. I, I won't say impossible because perhaps somebody very clever will come up with some corner of string theory that we haven't understood properly, which is still classical and, and um, find such a solution, but we don't have one today. Um, we'll therefore presumably need to understand something about quantum string theory if we want to explain dark energy or quantum gravity in the Sitter space, should any such backgrounds exist. Now, what, 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 am I, what am I talking about when I say non-classical string theory or quantum string theory? Here, I mean something reasonably precise. I mean, backgrounds in which the space-time curvature or the cosmological constant changes because of string quantum effects. So in highly supersymmetric backgrounds, if you fix the curvature scale of space-time, it doesn't get renormalized. But in any background that I want to call quantum, it will get renormalized. Um, and these are not backgrounds we typically study in, in standard string text for, for good reasons. There will be a subcategory of quantum string vacua that we'll call intrinsically quantum later, which we'll meet as, as one of our examples, <clears throat> which are cases where there is no tree level string solution at all. So two ways a, a background could be quantum is you start off with a Walsh sheet conformal field theory and you start computing loop corrections and you find the non-banishing. That's uh, a paradigm we, we understand well. Uh, a paradigm we understand less well is one where there is no tree level solution at all but if you included some kind of one loop potential, you could find a solution balancing tree against one loop, some tree level off shell configuration against a one loop. And we'll see evidence for, for both, or certainly for the second one, which, which is uh, more exotic. Um, so, so, uh, can I ask just like general question in the second kind of solutions that you're describing, shouldn't yeah. then I worry about higher loops as well? If tree Very good. So it will only be consistent if in the stabilized background balancing tree against say one loop, you can make the string, the, the string coupling very small. And we'll see you can do that. Okay. Actually, there will be, bizarrely enough, there will be configurations. And, and the, the first of these go, go back a long time. It's not, not coming from this talk, but here we'll give you one with a, a quantum definition. Um, but uh, there are cases where, where there'll be an extra parameter that can be made large. And when that parameter is large, the string coupling from the balancing is tiny. The loop effect should not destabilize it. I don't know how to do perturbation theory around such a background yet, but that's a really interesting question because you'll have to understand something about how to compute off shell, <coughs> which we don't usually do. Good. Okay. Any other questions so far? So the, the main part of today's talk um, intersects some very interesting swamp line conjectures by Hiroshi and Kumran and from um, Freibogel and, and Kleben about whether or not you have stable ADS space times. And forgive me if I'm, if I'm, if I'm mangling to some extent uh, the conjectures, but they, they, the conjectures roughly suggest that there's no stable ADS space time and no ADS CFT holography without supersymmetry. And here I'm going to tell you how to build a non-supersymmetric ADS that will not have supersymmetry at any scale, not at the string scale, presumably not even at the time scale, though that's much harder to talk about. <laughs> um, and they will be perturbatively stable. The issue of non-perturbative uh, stability is a really interesting one. I'll comment on it um, later. But it's not completely clear that there aren't even CFTs that could do the job yet. There is an interesting proposal by uh, Giambi and Perlmutter. Uh, they constructed a short RG flow by starting with a supersymmetric theory, deforming it by a double trace operator and flowing. And whether or not that theory results in a, in a non-supersymmetric CFT with a semi-classical gravity tool at finite n is still, I would say, unsettled. So we don't know for sure what's going on. But these arguments are very interesting and we'll, we'll 
see um, how they how they intersect what we talk about here today quite directly because this is a top down uh, construction, so we can see all the details in principle. So today I want to show you that there are examples of quantum string backgrounds with a world sheet definition. They're perturbatively stable and they have some computational control. You could in principle compute loops. <clears throat> all the moduli are stabilized in these models. That's very hard to do in general. And so I'm kind of happy to have a case with no moduli and a string coupling that can be made parametrically small. The examples are all gonna be in uh, three dimensions. There'll be ADS3 solutions and they will all have quantum uplift. So you'll have a negative cosmological constant, which will be tunable. So it can be made very, very tiny in principle. Uh, and then there'll be a certain amount of quantum uplift from loop corrections. And that quantum uplift is positive. Yet, despite the quantum uplift, it turns out the solutions could never become, never become decided, at least at one loop. And they also do not have supersymmetry restored in any obvious limit, actually in any limit. Um, so hopefully they'll be useful for exploring how we should do string theory and holography without supersymmetry. <clears throat> okay. No go results. Any any questions on sort of the intro, the intro part of the, the story? All right, let me turn to just a brief overview of no go results. And I apologize if a lot of this is familiar to many of you. It will be it will be brief and uh, sketchy. I have no interest in going into into nitty gritty details of anything. Just going to give you some of the ideas and some of the uh, uh, the pictures that emerge. So let me explain the the primary no go results. Uh, as I say briefly. The classic no-go result is very old. It goes back to Gary Gibbons. And uh, Gibbons looked at supergravity in 10 or 11 dimensions. And what he noticed is if you look at the Einstein equations and you look at the structure of the stress energy, the stress energy when restricted to two derivatives um, obeys the strong energy condition. So roughly speaking, strong energy is a statement that the time-time component of uh, uh, the Ricci tensor is positive and that forbids accelerated expansion. And the intuition for this is if you look in four dimensions, FRW, you get a relation between R00 and the acceleration. And if you want the acceleration to be positive, this better be negative. So SEC is forcing it to be positive, implying no acceleration. That's basically it. Everything else is sort of a glorified version of this from a space-time perspective, where one considers perhaps higher derivative terms and considers um, um, other corners of, of string beyond just these two cases. So let, <clears throat> today I'm actually going to discuss heterotic a lot. So it's useful here to remind you what heterotic string theory is about from a space-time point of view. So if you look in 10 dimensions at heterotic or equivalently type one, the theory is simple in the sense that it doesn't contain Ramon Ramon fields. It only has a metric, a dilaton, an H field, and some gauge fields, some Yang Mills fields, with an action that is uh, basically canonical at the two derivative level with the only subtlety coming in the Bianchi identity for H, which involves also the gauge fields. So if you want to uh, demonstrate what Gary demonstrated, that strong energy is obeyed, you write down the Einstein equations, RMN equals some stuff, you plug in zero, zero, and you just evaluate, and you see that everything appearing on the right-hand side is positive. There's no acceleration in supergravity. And that's basically it. <clears throat> it's a little more involved to show this, including R squared terms, but it again turns out to be true. It's very beautiful and simple in 10 dimensions, but that 10 dimensional argument also extends to compactification. So if you take a metric that's warped, so some space time metric plus an internal thing, say depending on Y, with a warp factor, then it's easy to show the lower dimensional R00 inherits the same positivity property as the 10 dimensional one as long as this wall factor is reasonable, meaning it doesn't have singularities and things that we don't really know how to control. So as long as this is a nice compactification, R00 in lower dimensions is also, also base uh, sec, or the stress energy base sec. All so, right. So, uh, can I ask, I mean, it's probably something stupid, but about this, this ar last argument you gave, yeah. it, what I'm getting from that is that the average R00 is bigger than zero, right? Because you need to integrate. You have to, in a good, so indeed, locally, it actually is violated. Okay. So if you look at it locally on the on an internal manifold, saying heterotic, sorry, at the two derivative level, I don't know if that's true. If you include R squared terms in heterotic, for example, okay. yeah. Yeah. and you look at the you look at over the internal manifold, it is definitely violated. Okay. And then what the only thing that you can say is once you integrate over the internal space. So the integration statement is basically the statement that the volume is finite. 
Yeah. So you get a Planck constant in your lower dimensional theory that's finite. If you have that condition, then this is enough to guarantee the space time uh, R zero zero is positive. Yeah. Yeah. But definitely, there's definitely a violation locally all over the place. That's for sure true. That's a very good point. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, one more question. So, so this has the, the same loopholes. It's like Maldacena Nunez, right? Like that's in the moment in which you have oriented force or singularities, then. Yeah, so this argument is all um, gravity, super gravity. So once mm -hmm. you include, so once you include oriental folds, or once you include higher derivative terms, say in type 2b beyond um, root gr, like the r to the fourth terms, at that point in time, you get some violation of this. So the violation is sufficient for you to be able to turn on, say, fluxes in the internal space. But it's not sufficient in type 2b, as far as we know, to give uh, acceleration. And in heteronic, you can show that very precisely. You can show that, so in heteronic, there are no orientables, but there are those same high derivative terms that the orientables support that allow violation of these, of these kinds of theorems. And those couplings in heteronic, the ones pre precisely dual to the orientable couplings of uh, type two, um, they again allow you to turn on flux times Minkowski, but there you can show very precisely that they do not give you uh, acceleration. So acceleration is much harder somehow than say via small violations like the ability to turn on fluxes in the background, which is also ruled out in, by, by a very similar argument. Is that, is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Any other, any other um, questions? You know, to, to sharpen these statements, one would need uh, a better understanding of the string effective action. And we only know, we only have control over very specific terms at higher orders at the moment. Um, so one can avoid doing the space-time approach and just turn to a Walshied approach. This, by the way, is probably the strongest logo theorem that I know of. Um, here in the Walshied approach, if you restrict to precisely to sit it, not FRW or something more general in space-time, you get a very large symmetry group on the Walshied. And the structure of the Walsh sheet theory, constraints on the central charge, mean that um, you can constrain any de Sitter solution, whether it's stable or unstable, that arises at tree level in string theory. And the tree level string effective action has an infinite number of interactions, right? It's just root gr, r squared, r to fourth, et cetera, plus all the other couplings. But there are no solutions. And you can show that very robustly, no macroscopic solutions. So this argument doesn't rely on um, details of fluxes or, or using um, dualities of any kind, as long as you have a wall sheet description you trust, uh, you, can't, you can't do it. The sitter is out. This is so all of this, sorry, go ahead. No. Sorry, can, can I ask about this? This is super interesting. So um, here you, you're imposing that the wall sheet has, as a global symmetry, the full isometric group of the sitter, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's yeah. how you get the middle. Yeah. What if I'm in the, if, if I just want something that works in the static patch or something where the only isometries that are actually, you know, they keep you within the static patch are just rotations and time translations? Yeah, that's a great question. This, that, that, this will weaken, at least a naive version of this will weaken. Yeah. Because it really uses the full, but I, I think, it, I think it will, you will still have constraints. So whether okay. or not the constraints are enough to rule out uh, uh, um, those solutions is, or, you know, those, those patches is, that's, 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 yeah, I, I, I don't know offhand, but. Okay, okay, thanks. Because you'll still get a CAC smoothie on the wall sheet from those, from the, from the residual symmetries. Right, but so, this is going to be like an SU2 for the rotations, right? So. Yeah, 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 it won't be, it won't be as large. Right, um, right. So you, you'd have to, um, yeah, good. No, it's an interesting question. That's a really interesting question. Right, thanks. Uh, oh, let me mention one other caveat. When we did this analysis, you'll see that we very specifically exclude three dimensions. And the reason we exclude three dimensions is in three dimensions, you can, you can pass an H-flux, the H-flux of heterotic through space-time without breaking the Renz invariance. But if you try to, the, all these Walsh-Sheet arguments usually involve some rotation to Euclidean space-time to, to control the theory. And that rotation becomes problematic if you have a flux going through space-time because the flux will become imaginary. So that's a case where we couldn't make a statement, but above three dimensions, we could make a statement. And all our, maybe it's not accidental that today all of these uh, um, examples I'm going to give are in three dimensions. So they will precisely involve this ingredient of an H flux through space time. Okay. Uh, sorry, can I ask something? Uh, does uh -huh. uh, this argument include Walsh sheet instanton connections? Yes, this argument includes Walsh sheet instantons. It includes uh, space times which are not uh, which are not even geometric in in 
um, where, where you couldn't even differentiate between, say, alpha prime corrections and Washington instantons. But it does not include space time instantons. So things non perturbative in G string would be beyond tree level. So the, the real constraint here is tree level string theory and really nothing else. Okay, so any, any quantum effect you can imagine at tree level, whether, so, so I've mis misled you here by writing an alpha prime expansion, because that's sort of intuitively how I think about the, the space time theory. But this, this will also apply to cases which are completely stringy, where there is no alpha prime expansion itself. Does Thank that? You. Yeah. Great. Any, any other questions here? Okay. So, okay, that's it, my overview of, of no goes. They're basically telling us if we want to get something accelerating, we're going to have to um, go beyond certainly classical string theory. <laughs> Not a big surprise to, to anyone here, I think. So let's turn to quantum string solutions. Steph, one last question before you continue. So these two no goes you talk about apply only to vacua or also to run away? Run, oh. like quintessence that you have also acceleration but it's a runaway yeah great question so here we are assuming uh stationary solutions yeah because, right yeah because if there's time dependence then we again have this problem that when we try to wick rotate the washi theory we're not completely sure what the mm -hmm. rules of the game are in terms of um what properties we should impose to get a good space-time solution so, and in the first argument also with just the oh, super gravity okay. and the fluxes yeah, good. Sorry, sorry. I, I should say the wall sheet argument is constrained to to be stationary. The space time argument, even including the R squared terms, applies also to things like FLRW and time dependent backgrounds. Because there we don't care. We can we can just constrain what the effective uh, space time potential is going to look like, <coughs> and and there it can be time dependent, indeed. So they're they're complementary in that respect. We we have, we have more power from space time when when the background is less symmetric. But from the well sheet, we can go to regimes that we just can't access otherwise. And, and we can go to high rulers in alpha prime um, and even non perturbative. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Great. So, ideally, I would love to be able to answer the following questions, which I can't today, but I, I, I'll, I'll list them anyway. Um, are there any decider solutions in string theory? That's our, that's our landscape uh, question. Are there non supersymmetric ADS solutions that, that we can sort of robustly all agree uh, exist? And if not, what kind of space time might replace a yes? And how does holography work? I want to actually would have commented on this today. There's a very weird connection with uh, a kind of TT bar deformed uh, theory that seems to be natural in this context. Uh, but I think it will take us too far afield to, to discuss. But anyway, each of these questions requires, seems to require some study of a non-classical string background. So let's try and uh, understand what that might mean. So, sorry, so what, Okay. Huh? Can I ask a question about your questions for the yeah. for the non SUSI ADS? Uh, do you mean like a perturbatively stable solution or non perturbatively stable? Probably, prob ideally, I mean you can ask both, but I, I think perturbatively stable we probably I, have. I think, I think we know examples which are perturbatively yeah. stable, right? Like yeah. the simplest that comes to mind is really simple. Just take ADS five cross RP five, which is supersymmetric, uh, but you can flip the spin structure. In the RP5, and that breaks all SUSIs. Um, but the bosonic equations of motion are exactly the same. Is it still the case that there's no tachyons below the BF bound in, in that setup, too? Uh, I don't think so, because this is like the bosonic fields are like exactly like an equals for the premium meal. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the one thing one has to check there is that there are loop corrections. Yeah. So, the, so if, you, if, you, if you take that background, the question is what's happening with, uh, with at one loop? Right. That's that's going to be the problem. That's going to be the the typical problem in in anything that embeds in string theory. You're going to run into this problem of how do I deal with the with the with the with the dilaton, right? Or with any yes, that could that can now develop a potential at one loop. This example does have like a, a potentially problematic and stabilized dilaton, um, but I think there's other examples like I like the eight is five cross CP tree that Hiroshi and friends found like a bubble of nothing for. I think that one was. So but this tree is not clear, right? Because in all yeah, the right, cases, as far as yeah. I don't remember correctly, the, the, the fields are saturating the VF bound. So it seems stable, but maybe higher orders could change it. I'll point out uh, an issue with this that we, so we could have made that kind of argument here, as we'll see in the example we're looking at, but there's a, there's a, an issue that was, that was very subtle to, to check. And I'll explain what that is, which is you can have tachyons exactly at the VF bound. 
in supersymmetric examples. And then when you break supersymmetry, it could go up, it could go down. And the question of which way it goes requires the loop analysis for perturbative stability. Um, in fact, that was the bulk of the analysis in this, in this paper. Um, <coughs> so what's the yeah, problem? Just, I'm sorry, just, I'm sorry. Uh, just go back to this, uh, this, this sitter result was in the world sheet result. It's, it's for heterotic only or for- No, it, it, will, it will also apply to type two, but we, we did it in heterotic because that was the, sorry, in type two, there's an added ingredient you could turn on, which we can't handle, which is Rouen Rouen fields. So yeah. there we don't know how to extend the result. So if you just restrict to NS sector backgrounds, it applies to type two and heterotic. But in, in type um, two, we, you know, isn't this then isn't this kind of trivial because there's an overall Delaton factor which multiplies the whole uh, world sheet or the whole action, and so you can never fix the Delaton, and so you can never get the sitter. Well, no, you can't. Well, no, no, you can't. In fact, I'm going to fix the Delaton in exactly this setting. For ADS, you can fix the Delaton at, at tree level. And for ADS, but for the sitter. Okay, I, I don't see how you can, from a world sheet perspective, fix the diligence because they all come with the same, uh, it's, it's, it's tree level, it's tree in string theory, so it's tree level, it's the same diligence factor. No, I should say, this this is true for stable or unstable, the set of solutions. So even if the diligence is running, but you had a tree level... So that's um, not the sitter, so... There's a potential... You doesn't you're, have the sitter isometries. Uh, Oh, you, 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 you couldn't imagine a background that was had tachyons that had, that was the sitter, um, at tree level. I mean, there's, there were such backgrounds in well, the well, Well, is not the sitter, but uh, okay. Anyway, does it, okay. No, I just want to understand. It, it wouldn't be yeah. rolling. It wouldn't necessarily be rolling. It wouldn't be rolling at tree level. It would, it, it would, you would get a potential at loop, at the loop order in that. No, but, but if, the, if, the, the, if the energy is non-zero, if you're in the sitter, then the diligence has to be rolling. It cannot be, I just think of it, it's just, you just have a potential of whatever theory you have and over, overall factor of the diligence. If the potential is not zero, the diligence has to roll. It's not so, stationary anymore, no? It's time yeah. dependent. It cannot be stationary with positive potential. It could be stationary perhaps in the anti -the sitter or in flat space, but not in the positive potential. So I think at tree level, one would never expect to the sitter solution. Okay. But okay, never mind, yeah. yeah. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, it won't it won't play any role in the in the construction particularly. Um, <clears throat> so, what's the problem with most non-supersymmetric string backgrounds? Well, the problem is that they're perturbatively unstable. So, meaning as soon as you break Susie, as we were just discussing, you'll generate a potential in one loop, and things start rolling, and things are no longer are no longer uh, stationary or static. So. How should we address this question? How, how should we solve this? So as a first approach to solve this problem, I want to try to construct what we'll call non-supersymmetric string islands. So the idea of string islands, uh, I saw in a paper by uh, Harvey and Dabakar uh, a long time back, uh, where they were construct, attempting to construct supersymmetric string islands. So what is a string island? A string island is a compactification, imagine a torus, but a compactification that is quotiented in such a way that you end up with no moduli in, at the level of conformal field theory. So the world sheet itself would have no moduli, <coughs> excuse me, and that would leave only the dilaton as, as something to worry about, to stabilize. And because supersymmetry is broken, there will typically be a one loop potential for the dilaton. And it's worth noting already, let's note already that there are three known non-supersymmetric tachyon free theories in 10 dimensions. And for each one of these theories, the one loop potential was positive. So for the O16 plus O16, it has this form e to the five plus pi, where phi is the dilaton. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Oops. So to convert the one loop, so now you have a one loop potential. Whatever the one loop is, it's a potential for the dilaton. But it's not a potential for any of the other moduli, because the other moduli don't exist. Everything has been masked up. So. Um, if you want to convert this one loop potential to a vacuum energy, you need to stabilize the dilaton. And let me sketch how you do this. Uh, it's useful to construct first an example in three dimensions, because there we have this extra ingredient of being able to thread an H3 through space time without breaking Lorentz invariance. You can try and do this in other dimensions using Ramon Ramon fluxes, but then the well sheet description becomes much more um, subtle to deal with. So let me recall the well-studied Freud-Rubin solution. 
uh, ADS3, cross S3, cross T4. <coughs> and I study this with only, in type 2B, with only an NS flux. So there's my depiction of ADS3 with some flux, electric flux going through the ADS3, N1 units of, eight, of uh, electric flux. There's the sphere with N5 units of magnetic flux, and there's a poor torus. Uh, in this case, in the supersymmetric case, the length scale of the ADS, which is the same as the length scale of the sphere, proportional to this flux quantum number, N5. And the dilaton is stabilized with a value given by the ratio of N5 to N1. So I can take this background, I can hole fix N5, which holes fix, holes fix the ADS length scale, and crank up N1 to get a very weakly coupled background. So this is a background that's been very heavily studied in the supersymmetric context. But a lot of analysis for everything down to the case of N5 equals one and for positive N5. So we have, we have some worldsheet technology that can deal with this SL2R WCW reasonably well today. And I guess Hiroshi and, and Juan were responsible for a lot of the understanding there. If we could replace that for Taurus by a string island that breaks Susie, we would generate a loop potential that would be, in principle, independent of the ADS cosmological constant. So a natural way to try and do this is to take the four torus and quotient by some group, G, that acts asymmetrically on the left and right. This is an old technology um, from the early days of overfolding, where one could do quotients, overfold quotients of, of backgrounds uh, differently on the left side of the string and the right side of the string. And there's some consistency conditions which are uh, essentially um, level matching to get a consistent theory out of this quotient. Um, intuition from 10 dimensions suggests that you might need to consider heterotic as well as type two models to find a case with positive one loop potential. But if we could do this, the strategy would be, okay, I tune my N5 to be enormous. So my ADS length scale is enormous. I get a loop correction, which is fixed in principle, independent of the ADS length scale. And so I can uplift ideally to uh, a positively curved background. Maybe try to generate this in it this way. Uh, and note again, the dilaton is already masked up and the string coupling can be made weak. So this is a nice uh, scenario to, to, try to, to try to do this, but we have some control. <clears throat> Let me give you the current status of this, uh, this approach. So supersymmetric string islands, as I mentioned, were studied by Dabakar and Harvey in the past. And they had found a particularly nice example in six dimensions. They took a four torus. Um, they took a four torus based on this particular Narayan lattice with an A4 symmetry. And at this particular point, it has a Z5 quotient uh, symmetry. So what you can do is you can asymmetrically mod by this Z5 on one side of the string and act with a shift on the other side of the string. And you find a background in which you break all the supersymmetries, the 16 supersymmetries on one side of the type two string and you preserve all the supersymmetries on the other side, so you end up with a, uh, with a background that is morally like a K3. This T4RG has the same supersymmetries in space-time as a K3, 16 supersymmetries, but it has no moduli. So it's completely frozen. It's a stringy, uh, a stringy background. Well, this seems uh, very promising. The only problem that we have with it is that it's supersymmetric, and we want to have a background that is non-supersymmetric. For this, somehow, it feels like four dimensions is problematic. Four-dimensional Ricci flat manifolds are already incredibly constrained. They're all somehow connected to supersymmetric backgrounds. This one is also, this stringy four-dimensional compactification, so to speak, is also, is also it, it appears, very constrained. The details of this action won't, won't matter for us today. Um, so I thought it was going to be relatively easy to generalize these models to something that would break all the supersymmetry on the four torus while freezing all the moduli. That's the hard constraint, no moduli, and generating no tachyons. But everything we tried, and we tried it in the context of heteroic, and we tried it in type two, at least with abelian quotients, either gave us back moduli or gave us back some supersymmetry from twist detectors. And we didn't find a, 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 yet a, a simple example which breaks supersymmetry, doesn't have any moduli, and doesn't have tachyons. Now, this might all be lamppostish. Uh, what we were studying were quotients by abelian groups, but we know from just looking at C equal one CFTs that the cases that don't have any moduli are, 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 are constructed by quotienting by non-abelian group actions. 
So perhaps we need to generalize this uh, construction to modding by non-abelian Gs. And that's something we're looking at, uh, or have been looking at. <clears throat> OK. There's still an interesting model that looks like it works. And it, it requires one extra twist. So you take the dabakar harvey construction of this quotient of T4, that's supersymmetric, with supersymmetry all on one side of the string. And then you do a further quotient of the S3 by a ZN, which has the interpretation of introducing Kaluza-Klein monopoles in the background. This was studied by Kudasov, Larson, and Lee a long time ago. When you do this, this breaks supersymmetry on the other side. Now the Susie breaking is not independent of the ADS scale because it's coming from an action on the S3, which is the same size roughly as the ADS3. <laughs> so this is a case where you can generate a moduli-free non-supersymmetric background, but with a, uh, uh, a breaking scale set by the ADS landscape. I, 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 we were kind of hoping to get something independent of the ADS landscape initially, but it's still kind of interesting to study. And if we can work out that, now, now you have the question of one loop. So Miguel, this would fit your paradigm of make sense at this level, but then we have to ask ourselves what happens in one loop? Because there is a tachyon at the BF bound in this setting. And we have to understand, does the one loop shift it down or shift it up for perturbative stability? Okay. Here's the second approach and the one I want to uh, focus on today. I, I, about five minutes, right, roughly? Um, so let me, let me, let's see if we can go through this. So the, the, pre, the preceding discussion was in the context of the superstring, and the model involved a fairly complicated overfolding process. <clears throat> but we can ask, could there be something simpler? Why don't we just consider non-supersymmetric strings to start? And let's try and piggyback off our preceding setup. So that, as I mentioned earlier, there are three known strings in 10 dimensions without tachyons. There's the oldest one, the 016 cross 016 heterotic string found by these authors. Um, there's something called a type zero prime B string found by Sanyari, which is a very interesting cousin of type 2B. It has a lot of the structure of type 2B. Um, not enough to be to have a duality group, it looks like, but enough to, to, uh, to be surprising, I would say. Um, and then there's a variant of open string theory where instead of doing an O9 plane that would generate an SO group, you insert an O9 plane that would generate uh, a USP group, put in anti D9 brains to cancel the tadpole, and uh, you can find a consistent open string theory there, which has a dilatant tadpole but no charged tadpole. And this was found by Sugimoto. So these are the three uh, known strings in 10 dimensions. Each one of them has a positive dilaton potential with some coefficient alpha. So the structures are, are somewhat similar. And uh, many authors have studied what we can call quantum solutions of the type ADS cross sphere, um, where they were following, they were, they were trying the following approach. If you look at the dilaton equation of motion <coughs> for an S field, um, you can find constant phi solutions, <coughs> excuse me, by balancing the flux against the potential. Um, so if you have a constant phi solution, this term just vanishes. You have the potential term against some classical flux term. And if you look for a minimum here for constant phi, that minimum can become weakly coupled when you crank up the flux. These are what we want to call intrinsically quantum solutions. Meaning if we turn off this potential, there's no classical solu string solution to start with. There's no ADS cross S classically. The ADS cross S only exists when balancing one loop against tree level. And it's a case where there should be some kind of string perturbation theory around the resulting background. Uh, the, what typically happens in these backgrounds is that you find tachyons below the BF bound. And one can try to get rid of them by quotienting or doing something, but they, they, they seem to be there, in, at least in initial attempts. Okay, let's try to uh, evade this problem and find a case that might even uplift to consider. So for reasons that I'll explain in a moment, we want to consider the same ADS3, the same S3, but we'll replace our four torus by another S3 and a circle. And the reason is basically because uh, Kumran and uh, Paul Ginsberg computed the, the heterotic potential on the circle a long time ago. So we can piggyback off their results. If we, if we knew the potential on T4, we could have done this on T4 directly. This is a background that only has NS fields turned on. <coughs> Excuse me. There are three integers parameterizing the background. The amount of electric flux through ADS3, the amount of magnetic flux through S, the first S3, the 
the amount of magnetic flux through the second S ring. I want, I want to think about it as big, 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 small. And then that's what the resulting picture will look like. So really we're gonna end up reducing on this circle to an effective theory um, in nine dimensions. So this, is, this background has been very well studied in the supersymmetric context. Again, there are tachyons exactly at the BF bound in the supersymmetric theory. So they're sitting right there. If they went a little bit more tachyonic, they would, be, they would destabilize the background. If they went a, a little bit um, less tachyonic, we, we would be okay, but we'd have to, we have to worry about it. So it's not enough for us to look at the, the tree level background here. So let's embed it in the 016 cross 016 string. Now you might say, well, wait, you're talking about no moduli and these string islands, but now we have this circle and the circle has a size. We also have the dilaton and we have <coughs> Wilson line moduli that might destabilize the background. But we can cure all these problems. So, uh, Sab, can I, can I, I also worry about the squashing parameter of the S3s. Very like, good, yeah, that, that is also, that is also a worry. So right. S3 is highly symmetric. So you're at a point which is likely to be an extremum because you have a enhanced chiral algebra at that point. Um, and the, the real problem we, we're going to have is when we're, when we have moduli that are not at extrema, which will have a potential, but that's a very good point. And in fact, um, we've been computing the, the one loop potential, not on R9 cross S1, but in this background itself, and one can actually check what's happening with that, with those extra JJ bar definitions, <coughs> which are there. Actually, there's a, there, in hindsight, there was a better way to proceed, which is not to use S3, but to use um, a quotient of SU2 by U1 and then stick an extra circle here. So, so can I ask like a follow-up question? Because you know you said you were using the, the circle because you can use the, the, the exact um, calcium energy that you get from, 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 uh, from, from, from Kumbrum and, and, and Paul because they, they have like an expression which is, uh, depends on the string scale and the like. Uh, but if you compactify on a no supersymmetric manifold, you could also just use the Casimir piece of it, right? So, uh, very large. so, so here, here today, I, I want to take an effective field theory perspective on this in the sense that we will see that if this space was enormous, I, I cranked up all the flux. Yes. This would look roughly like R9 or with yes. very small curvatures cross the circle where their computation of the potential should be decent. Yes, yes, yes. And as long as this space is big, then we can just close to kind of reduce that potential and, and, and. Oh. Yes, you're yeah, no, no, I'm completely on board with what you're doing. I'm just, I'm just asking that because you were kind of like avoiding other manifolds because you wanted to have the circle because that way you could use the results. Wouldn't it yeah, be yeah. possible to, you know, uh, okay, to, to to compute the the one loop Casimir in the effective field theory for general manifolds as well, or is there an obstacle to that? Well, there's an obstacle if the manifold is not um, a tree level background because I wouldn't know how to do it in string theory. Yeah, okay. Right, that's the problem. So, so if you want it to be reachy flat, then you're pretty constrained because, yeah. because okay. they tend to, the examples we know tend to be supersymmetric or, or, or not supersymmetric, but you know, you need to reach, we could have replaced this with K3, for example, and try to compute yeah, it. Exactly. That's a really interesting question, by the way. Okay. Because there, I don't even know what the critical points look like. Okay. On a, on a circle or a torus, you can guess what the critical point should should look like, but on other spaces, it's not at all clear. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, but that's you could definitely do that. Um, <clears throat> something I've, I've been wondering about a lot. Uh, <clears throat> good. Other, other questions. Oh, I'm already over. So <laughs> would it be okay if I run over like a, a few, just a few minutes more? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, pictures. Okay. So, um, okay. So. This background has a Walshy definition, but let's do it from effective field theory. You do the Kluzakian reduction on the metric, which is sphere cross sphere cross circle, and you get an effective potential in nine dimensions. If you minimize that potential, this is all true, by the way, in the supersymmetric theory. I'm doing nothing special here. Uh, you find the length of the sphere. First sphere is set by the flux going through. The length of the second sphere is set, set by the flux going through it. And you get G string stabilized, again, in terms of a ratio of the magnetic fluxes to the electric fluxes with a cosmological constant, which is again, independent of this electric flux parameter N1. So this is all straightforward and, and coming from identical to the supersymmetric theory. Um, but again, we know the string coupling can be made arbitrarily small by cranking up N1 independent of the ADS length scale. So we can make it very, very weak if we wish, um, fixing uh, lambda in space time. 
And to show you we're not cheating, here's a here's a, uh, a graph of the potential for the dilaton as a as a as a the potential energy for the dilaton as a function of phi, and you see the minimum sitting right there. This is for some values of n five n five hat. <coughs> so long ago, the, str the string one loop potential was studied by um, Paul Ginsberg and, and Kumran, and it has two key features, which we'll use today. Uh, they studied it on R9 cross S1. And what you find there is that the radius of the circle um, has, a, uh, has a minimum at the self dual radius. So it's completely stringy. So it really is tiny. And at that point, um, the dilaton gets, uh, dilaton, the radius of the circle gets masked up. It gets frozen there. Uh, it's also true at that point that all the Wilson line moduli get masked up. So indeed, all of those perturbative moduli go away from the one loop. So, so, so we don't have why is the reason they become massive? Because of the quantum potential or? From the quantum potential. So this is all coming from the string one loop potential. Mm -hmm. So here, here, here I, we didn't have to go through this hard work of trying to find an island that doesn't have any tree level moduli. The one loop potential has done the job for us. Actually, actually, it's even more stronger than that. It, because of non abelian enhancement, we argue it's true to all loops. That's the critical point. Good, good. Indeed, this point has an enhanced symmetry. And because of that enhanced symmetry, as Cameron just explained, uh, this is expected to be a critical point to all loops in G string. So this is a great starting point. We've now, we've basically got this tiny circle at a string scale, we reduce on it. We've killed off all the moduli that we had to worry about there. And we're left with our ADS3 cross S3 cross S3. So you can pack the by down further and, um, okay, uh, but, but, but this is not the clearest way to state this. And you ask the question, should, you know, can I uplift? Why can't I uplift now? I'm getting, I'm getting a, a, a one loop contribution to the potential. I will make my ADS scale. Let's, let's set these two pluses to be the same, just to get rid of a parameter. Uh, I'm going to ask what value of G string should I pick to get to sit it? And if you treat the potential as, as um, without back reacting on the, on the diloton uh, minimum directly, just as a uplift parameter, because the diloton was frozen at tree level, you, we would have said this. That you for, for for n five bigger than this value for any fixed g string, I fix my g string to be small. I can pick an n five big enough that the ADS is flat enough that I'll get. I should have gotten a positive this way, space time. <coughs> um, on the other hand, if you do it more carefully and you actually combine the tree and one loop potential and reminimize, you find this doesn't happen. It adjusts itself at one loop in a way that uh, precisely compensates to keep the ADS lens scale, uh, or to keep it ADS. <clears throat> I, I'm, let me show you in pictures. It's gonna be easier than looking at these form, formulae because I'm already running over. Let's look at it at a, in a couple of pictures. So this is a plot of the one loop corrected cosmological constant versus N1. So you can see that if you start making N1 smaller and smaller and smaller, that's the, that's the regime where you're actually going toward what naively you, we would have classically said is strong coupling because G-string should be getting stronger. We'll see that that's not actually true. But um, what you find is the cosmological constant, and this is for these different values of N5, tends to get smaller and smaller, but it doesn't ever head up to positive. It stabilizes down here. <coughs> um, if you look at the size of the spheres versus N1, it's a similar phenomenon. We start cranking down N1, because of this loop correction, the size of the sphere changes a little bit from its classical value, but it, stabilize, it, it, it changes in a way that stabilizes as N1 gets smaller. Remember, N1 was controlling the string coupling. So N1 was big, the classical string coupling was small. Here's the more interesting point. If you look at the one loop corrected string coupling, you find that as you make N1 smaller and smaller and smaller, it also stabilizes. It's, it doesn't go to infinity. In fact, it goes to a value that becomes small if you crank up the, the amount of N5 flux, magnetic flux in the background. So here there's a very sharp deviation from the classical physics that we see, that we see where the string coupling should become big. This is a phenomena which reflects the fact that non-supersymmetric strings hate strong coupling. These potentials basically want to keep you away from strong coupling. And that's exactly what this is doing. N1, the fundamental strings you put in this background, 
moderate the strong coupling behavior you expect as you approach NS vibrates. They make it go to a constant. Now here we're turning off the number of fundamental string, but the potential itself doesn't want you to go to strong coupling. So it forces the string coupling to a finite value. Here's an actual expression for it. If we compare the tree loop um, coupling in blue here, it would diverge as N1 gets small, but the actual one loop corrected string coupling goes to a finite value. And that finite value can be made small by making the amount of flux through the spheres big. That's, the, that's what we mean by intrinsically quantum string vacuum. It's still got a weakly coupled uh, G string, even though uh, there was no reason to expect it without the loop. So um, there's an expression for the largest value of that G string can, at can attain over N1, which scales like one over N, where N is the amount of flux going through the spheres. <clears throat> this is for the case where N5 equals N5 hat equals N. So you make the ADS very flat. Even if you make N1 zero, you have a finite G string, totally non-classical string backgrounds. But we can approach it from a, a family of classical string backgrounds where we can do perturbation. Okay, let me summarize. Sorry, and I apologize for going over. Um, so what do we have? We have a non-supersymmetric ADS solution. It's completely non-supersymmetric. It's embedded in a string that itself is non-supersymmetric. It has a, a wall sheet description. You can compute with that wall sheet description. Um, and that wall sheet description defines something in the sense that if you start computing correlation functions that you expect to be part of the space-time holographic CFT, you will get answers in, 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 in these calculations to the extent to which the wall sheet string makes sense. Um, it has a string coupling that can be made weak. It has an intrinsically quantum limit, which also can be weakly coupled, weirdly enough, even when it has no strings in the background at all, just because of the one loop potential. We checked that it's, I said here it appears, but we actually checked that it is free of tachyons below the BF bound. That was the, the most subtle part of this. Does it become perturbatively unstable? But it looks like they go the other way. They become less tachyonic as we, as we, uh, um, as we include the one loop. And that's the bulk of our analysis. And hopefully these Walsh correlators should tell us something about holography. <clears throat> you might worry about other instabilities. Klabinoff and friends pointed out that multi-trace operators that are marginal can, can um, um, develop tadpoles that would destabilize backgrounds like this. In fact, most examples ran into this kind of problem. But we expect in this case that all of the dangerous multi-trace operators that could appear are charged. And then they can't get a, if they're charged in space time, you can't get a tadpole for them. So this also looks good. Um, there's most definitely the possibility of non-perturbative instabilities, particularly nucleation of fundamental strings. But what can that do? We started with a background with N1 units of electric flux. If you start nucleating fundamental strings, let's assume we, it's in accord with what we expect from weak gravity, that there are, there are fundamental strings that, that can be nucleated. They will discharge the electric flux in space-time. N1 will rapidly head towards zero, but zero itself is still an ADS space here because there's still an ADS supported just from the potential. So that's not gonna kill this kind of background, that instability. And then there'll be no flux left in space-time, but there will be a flux to the spheres. So the question then is, what, what, what can happen, um, <coughs> excuse me, what can happen to the flux through the spheres? Uh, there's a ton of questions to understand now about tachyon-free non-supersymmetric strings. Now can it build something, actually build a background that, that looks tractable. <coughs> you could have asked, what if you replaced it, the S3 cross S1 with a torus or a K3, or what's, what's the structure here? Instead of worrying about instanton corrections and things to, to stabilize uh, backgrounds, I really want to just understand loops in these backgrounds. What can we learn from loops? Because we can actually compute loops in a way that could be robust. But it does also appear that if the center space exists, it requires something more then I should say here, at least a one loop Casimir energy, because who knows what can happen at high loops? That's another very interesting question. Um, what, what one can say about going to higher genus, which now is actually kind of interesting. It can look for critical points. And I'll, I will end uh, there. Thank you for your patience.